Hello, these are the news from Kazakhstan, and I'm Norbek Svitakhunov. Another restless weekend in the western Kazakh city of Aktobe. First reports from The Wire read that several explosions were heard on police day. There were hostages and residents of nearby houses were evacuated. The prosecutor general's office official's press release appeared only in the evening, saying that the shootout was part of a special operation to arrest suspected killers of police officer Jacques Salgbaev. He died earlier in another shootout near Kirpichny village. Criminals were eliminated after putting up a fight, and names of the dead were released. More on the story along with witness accounts in the next report. One of the most widely spread versions among the witnesses in Aktobe has three men suspected of killing policeman Timir Begzhak Zilgbaev trying to hide in the house of a local Hila Kadarata. Because of this, the information agencies first reported that the man was taken hostage. Later, it turned out that the men were hiding not far from the used metal collection center. Neither the regional prosecutor's office nor the Department of Internal Affairs give comments about the special operation. The crime scene is still sealed off by the police. Potential witnesses of the events refuse to talk on camera. According to some reports, witnesses who recorded the incident on their mobile phones were summoned to the police. One thing is clear, the special operation to arrest the suspects lasted from 2 p.m. till almost 8 a.m. on Saturday, with short breaks in between. The suspects opened fire in response to every demand to surrender. Some of the witnesses say an armed troop carrier arrived as reinforcement and along with the guns and special forces unit used at least five grenades as local residents recall. Two of the three suspects, Jalmarza Bekbao of 21 and Yernazar Mirzagali, 23, died at the scene. The youngest of the suspects, underaged Gabit Kurmankulov, was wounded and taken to the emergency hospital in Aktobe. One policeman and one special forces serviceman were wounded as well. Saulet Kilimbirdiev, the chief doctor of the hospital where all the wounded were brought, said in an off-the-record interview that all sustained moderate injuries and will be discharged in the nearest future. As previously reported, the General Prosecutor's Office named three people who took part in the Aktobe police shootout. These are 17-year-old Gabit Kurmankul, 21-year-old Jol Morzabik Baulov, and 23-year-old Yernazar Morzagali. According to official reports, Jol Morzabik Baulov and Yernazar Morzagali died at the scene, and Gabit Kurmankul was wounded. Journalists tried to find the young man's traces in social networks. Gabit Kurmankulov, born 1994, was found registered with Russian My World. However, the last visit dates back to December 2011, with the update saying he's starting read Muslim prayers and calling others to follow his lead. Same social network has a page for Jalmurza Bigbaouov, who also visited his page in 2011 for the last time and left a post about the afterlife. His blog includes the following entry, I'm not happy, I want to become a terrorist. Azatik radio reporters managed to reach one of the man's mother. He was just a young boy strolling around the city. I'm a single woman and he's my only son. He didn't do anything to anyone. How would I know? I don't know if he's dead or alive. I can't find him. They're probably hiding him. They shot him because he was Muslim. The whole country knows what kind of a son I had, my only son. Initial reports announced that the alleged perpetrators may have supposedly taken a hostage, a local healer named Qadirata. This YouTube video features a man who talks about his healing powers, but notes that he has no medical education or an appropriate license. So far, we have not managed to reach the healer, although the General Prosecutor's Office has already refuted reports of any hostages or explosions during the special operation in Aktobe. Experts' assessment of the recent incident in Aktobe and their hypotheses as to what took place in the next story. An armed assault on the road, policemen or a terrorist act. Following the murder of a law enforcement officer last Thursday, a shootout and a series of explosions in Aktobe, the internet was flooded with information that the incident was an extremist attack timed to the police day celebration. Officials are denying the assumption, however, the question remains open. What is really happening in Aktobe? Amir Jan Tagusov, the former deputy defense minister of Kazakhstan, says that the incident was an armed clash between desperate people and law enforcement officials. He is certain that the main cause was unemployment among young adults and the lack of firearm sale control. I don't think they're equipped in a special way. They are ordinary people who did these because they are living beyond poverty line and can't do anything about it. They're desperate with their lives. 
от такой жизни люди. Political analyst Talgat Mamaraimov doesn't see any signs of terrorism in recent policemen shootouts and explosions. He says that none of the existing organizations has assumed responsibility for the incident, made any demands or exhibited political position. The expert believes that the several people have committed a felony wishing to diminish the influence of law enforcement in Kazakhstan politics. The attack was a blow against law enforcement, foremost against the National Security Committee. This way they are trying to eliminate Nurtai Abukhayev, a close Nazarbayev associate. Many consider him as a likely transitional president of Kazakhstan. Arat Narbambetov, a retired National Security Committee colonel, has no doubts that the blasts targeted at law enforcement officials are signs of a power struggle. However, he believes it is a terrorist cell that's succeeding in promoting their influence and not political elite. The colonel explains that armed clashes of last and this year are similar involving aggressive youth from suburbs and the general prosecution office that comes up with unreasonable crime leads just to drop them later on. <laughs> They're also fighting for the political and ideological influence, with their envoys have long been active in our country and they've even managed to achieve certain results. Experts agree on the one thing, the lack of awareness among the population leaves it with nothing but assumptions and unanswered questions. Special operations of this kind are not uncommon in Aktobe region. A similar incident took place last summer in the villages of Shubarshi and Kenki, Iraq, when suspected police officer murderers were detained. Law enforcement officials sustained losses in those shootouts, after which talks of terrorism and religious extremism entered the conversation in the region. A chronology of similar incidents in the next report. <laughs> I heard a blast, a loud explosion, then I saw the police, special forces and fire trucks arriving at the scene. This is how October residents recall the explosion at the local Department of National Security Committee on May 17, 2011. An identified individual detonated himself right in the lobby of the building. One of the NSC staff members died from inflicted injuries, another one was heavily wounded. Another surviving victim is a 32-year-old businessman who spent a month in a hospital. Social networks were the first to react to the unprecedented incident in Kazakhstan. Twitter and Facebook users were convinced this was a terrorist attack. A few hours later, the oversight authority confirmed that the bomber was wearing a suicide belt. The crime was committed by a 25-year-old resident of Aktobe, although the prosecutor general's office tried to avoid using the word terrorism for a long time. <laughs> Rahimjan Makatov, born 1986, committed an act of suicide bombing in the NSC building of Aktobe region to avoid being liable. It hasn't been revealed to the public what charges was Makatov trying to avoid. It was only emphasized that he was a member of the criminal organization and also a man of faith. Security forces conducted a special operation and detained 20 people in the southwestern Aktobe on May 18th. Twelve of them were linked to the NSC blast and later convicted. Group leader Yeset Mahuov was sentenced to 17 years in maximum security prison with confiscation of property. Two members of the group received a sentence of 10 years, one of 8 years, two of 3 years, and the rest of 5 years in minimum security prison. Aktobe region became a hot spot once again when two patrolling police officers were killed on July 1st in the Shubarshi village. Unidentified individuals gunned them down in front of the police station. While pursuing the criminals, one of the Arlan Tactical Assault Group soldier was killed as well. The ensuing special operation in the neighboring Kenkiak village will be long remembered by the local population. Surveillance of anyone acquainted with suspects was set up in Kinkiak village. The only mosque became a home and prison for 17 local residents. Most of the villagers avoided the camera. The few who talked to reporters were convinced that the killings of policemen and Arlan Tactical Assault Group soldier were a form of retribution, since security officials prohibited locals to pray and humiliated believers. These policemen used to always kick us in the back whenever we pray, they enter the mosque with no respect, of course everyone is angry. By any excuse, they accused us of Wahhabism even if we only read the Muslim prayers. Meanwhile, the authorities refute allegations saying a criminal organization was simply stealing oil under the guise of a religious one. A special operation came to an end on July 11th with a 14-hour long battle, which resulted in the death of nine people. The six terminated individuals were the leaders of this particular criminal organization. The survivors were tried behind the closed doors. They were charged under five different articles, including murder and terrorism. Two defendants were sentenced to life in prison, the other two to 14 and six years in minimum security prison.
These incidents were presented as terrorist attacks to solve certain political issues. In particular, we should keep in mind that this was the year of presidential elections. Therefore, the threat of terrorism and nationalism played its part, and the voters rallied around powerful authoritarian government of President Nazarbayev. The October incidents were followed by the one in Astana, where an explosion occurred near the temporary detention facility of NSC on May 24th. Two explosions in Atarao on October 31st, a suicide bombing in Taras on November 17th, and finally a shootout in the Boraldai village near Almaty on December 3rd, which was also ranked as the manifestation of extremism. In another border incident over the weekend, an attack on the border guard officer occurred near the Intamak checkpoint in southern Kazakhstan. A bystander was killed as a result of open fire. As the Border Agency Press Service reports, the incident took place at around 6.30 p.m. June 24th at the Kokterek settlement. The officer opened fire in self-defense, shooting in the air and at the wheels of the assailant's cars, states the report. Eyewitnesses, however, say the shooting was carried out chaotically and the officer was in civilian clothes. Our, new, our crew was in Kokterek talking with local residents. Eyewitnesses say that four men were beating a young guy wearing a t-shirt and shorts just 20 meters from the border outpost. In return, the man fired an assault rifle. Only distant yells stopped these developments, witnesses claim. The rifle bearer immediately went inside the outpost gate and re-emerged a moment later wearing a military uniform. A stray bullet hit the 18-year-old Nurjan Kalikbaev in the head, approximately 150 meters away from the site. His brother took the wounded boy to the rural clinic, which apparently failed to provide even basic first aid, redirecting the patient to the regional hospital. The young man died in the morning, never regaining consciousness. The only thing Nurjan's family is demanding now is to find and punish the guilty party. The grandfather of Vladislav Chelach, suspected of murdering 15 people, demands an hour-long private date with his grandson. On Monday, June 25th, Vladimir Chelakh appealed to the public for help, saying that the young man's relatives are finding out about the course of the investigation exclusively from the press. Moreover, following the news closely, they see that the deceased soldiers' interviews contradict the official lead on the incident. I demand that the law enforcement and investigation bodies reconstructed the events reported on TV during Kim's funeral. I demand a visit with my grandson for longer than 15 minutes, at least an hour, and without witnesses. People there always interrupt the conversation. His human rights and presumption of innocence are violated. Former military servicemen advised Vladimir Chelik to look for discrepancies found in media reports. For instance, in one interview, Ruslan Kim's family members speak in detail about his fatal wounds. This account is an obvious contradiction to the official version, Vladimir Chelik says. There is still no clarity with the three unidentified corpses. If there are not border guards, then whose bodies are they and where are the missing soldiers? The family decided not to wait any longer for a lawyer promised by public foundations and continued to collect money to pay for their own lawyer. Chelak's neighbors, acquaintances and anyone not indifferent to the tragedy, including foreign citizens, make their contributions. A total of $15,000 is needed at the moment. A demonstration in support of Vladislav Chelak was held in the Almaty Arbat over the weekend. Alona An refuses to believe that the 19-year-old could kill 14 of his fellow soldiers and a security guard. The young woman believes that authorities are to blame for the Argankirgan tragedy. The city residents reacted to the unusual dance event in different ways, some with great surprise. The professional dancer wanted to present the authorities with her point of view on what happened. The young woman chose the dance, since other forms of protests in Kazakhstan may lead to jail. Dear representatives of authorities, you are doing good with one hand, but then your other hand turns the good into bad. Both hands must work together to do good. If this does not happen, your good deeds are not needed at all. I believe that there is no greater crime than the framing of a young man. Vladislav has nothing to do with the incident. On Monday, the Respublika News website informed that Vladimir Kozlov, the leader of Alha political party pending registration, is accused of two more articles of the Criminal Code of Kazakhstan. Earlier it was reported that Vladimir Kozlov is accused over Article 164, incitement of social hatred, but now the website confirms the information that on June 18th, new criminal cases were instigated on top of the previous, including Article 235 and 170. 
The same charges were brought this spring against Vzgled newspaper editor Igor Vinyavsky and will be likely used against stage director Balat Atabaev and youth leader Jean Balat Mamai. The third charge relates to the organization of a criminal group. Reporters assume it is used to instigate two criminal cases at once against activists of the protest movement, among former oil workers from Zhanaozian, and also against Mukhtar Ablyazov, Mladbek Kitibaev and Vladimir Kozlov. The arrested stage director Balat Atabaev and politician Jean Balat Mamai were taken to the Aktau pre-trial detention facility. This was reported by the wife of opposition politician Vladimir Kozlov Ali Aturuzbekova to Guljan.org. Turuzbekova says that activists charged with inciting social hatred are held in the same detention center with oppositionists Vladimir Kozlov and Serik Saparkali. The defense attorneys are expected to arrive in Aktau on Tuesday, with the questioning sessions planned for Wednesday. Previously, on June 15th, the court changed Atabayev and Mamai's measure of restraint from own recognizance to actual arrests. Shortly thereafter, both were detained and escorted to the Mangistar region for the trial. The play Avalanche was performed in the Aksarai Theater in Almaty, dedicated to the arrested stage director Bolat Atabaev. At the core of the play is people who lived in fear of authorities for many years were able to overcome this fear and fight back. <laughs> Not only ordinary theatre enthusiasts responded to the idea of supporting the renowned director, but also public activists, oppositionists and actors from other theatres. It was clear that people who attended the event sympathized with Bolat Atabaev. At the end, the play received a standing ovation and some people even wanted to see him on the stage. Dana Atabaeva, the director's sister, said she was leaving to Aksal to act as a public defender at the upcoming trial. I'm flying to Aktau shortly. I've submitted an appeal to appoint me as public defender. I'm going there Tuesday night and I hope they will allow me to meet my brother. I just want to see him and make sure he's okay. I said already that he's a man with a strong spirit and I hope he will be able to go through all of this. To recap, the stage director together with journalist Jan Balat Mamai were arrested on June 15 by the National Security Committee. Eyewitnesses say that men in plain clothes arm locked the 60 year old at the Bayev and took him away by force. The stage director and his associate are facing charges of inciting social hatred, as today's performance at the Bayev supporters showed that the spirit is still strong and they carry on with the ideas of their leader. <laughs> Karhanda metallurgists officially declared plans to hold a preemptive strike this Friday. The protest action was supported by over 10,000 workers of the metallurgic plant. If miners agreed on the increase of their wages by 2.6% and the signed agreement with ArcelorMittal Temertal prohibits them from taking part in a strike, the steelmakers continue insisting on a 30% increase. The workers of the metallurgical plant announced additional demands, asking for the recalculation of last year's salaries in line with 2011 inflation rates, and also bring the current wages to the corresponding level. In addition, employees need a moratorium on further downsizing. According to the estimates of the Labour Union Committee, the plant fired 14,000 people over the past 15 years. This means the workload is constantly rising while salaries remain the same. Only a limited number of workers not directly affecting continuous production cycle will go on strike June 29th, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. Employees have already set up a committee which will lead the preemptive strike. If they will not take proper steps to solve the issue or offer compromise settlements, then we have a right to inform the administration within three working days about our new demands and launch an indefinite strike. An anti-corruption campaign was held in Astana on Sunday. It all started with the story of Vladimir Svidersky, an entrepreneur from Kakshetau whose son was involved in a scandal. To recap, the prosecutor of Almala region and former deputy head of internal affairs Alexander Kulinich both filed a lawsuit against Svidersky Jr. Meanwhile, another protest failed on Monday. More details next.
On Monday, employees of security company Blast Legion, together with human rights activist Baladbek Blalov, plan to hold a rally in front of the building of the city prosecutor's office. For the last two years, they were not paid salary arrears despite the court ruling to the contrary. The prosecution office remains silent even after numerous appeals of the 15 protesters. This time, yet again, they weren't allowed to hold a rally and were advised to just file an official complaint. File a complaint and you will receive a reply within the set time frame. Baladbek Blyalov is quite determined in his actions. He accuses the prosecutors of negligence and even forwarded an ultimatum. We demand appropriate punishment for prosecutors' office staff whose inaction and red tape also contributes to perpetrators' evasion of obligations. On Monday, activists were actually able to hold a rally in Astana. Of course, it was not the same as Occupy by protests, but at least it did really take place. The underlying message was that of the fight against corruption, while its main quest was Kokshtau businessman Vladimir Svidersky, whose son was involved in the infamous internet video confession about bribing law enforcement authorities. The video clearly mentions the prosecutor of the Akmala region Azamad Zhakubayev, as well as the former deputy minister of interiors Alexander Kulinich. Big business cannot survive in Kazakhstan without patronage. For instance, a casino with a monthly multi-billion turnover obviously cannot operate without protection. There is no one protecting me at the moment. Maybe it is the problem because I'm not paying anyone for protection. Such openness is quite rare, hence why organizers of the rally made an emphasis on the case of the Kokshitao businessman moving from individual issues to the bigger overall situation. If the key corrupt officials in the presidential administration, government and parliament won't be held liable for their actions, the corruption will keep flourishing in Kazakhstan. Protesters believe the fight against corruption should be held everywhere, therefore they decided they need to organize a unique tour across all regions and help active citizens with the organization of protests. At the same time, Batalova remarked that she no longer wants to be a nanny for the real estate investors, since it's time to publicly defend their rights on their own. A movie entitled Goldfish Quench My Pain, dedicated to the people with cancer-related illnesses, was presented on Monday in Almaty. This way, organizers intend to attract the attention of the public and authorities to the issues of cancer. Statistics hasn't yet made it clear what's the exact number of Kazakh citizens in need of palliative care, one that is designed to help the suffering patient. Experts say that the numbers have climbed over tens of thousands. Project proponents criticize the bureaucratic procedures and state that it is necessary to make the medication management system available to cancer patients. Another key point is the establishment of new hospices, special centers that support critical patients. There are six of them in the entire country now, whereas Almaty alone requires at least five facilities. Finally, it takes about $470 to provide palliative care for one person, while there isn't enough allocated budget money, experts complain. The main goal is to draw the attention of decision-makers. The prime example of particular patients is shown in this film. There is a problem, and it must be addressed urgently. Unfortunately, at the moment, we have an unjustifiably strict system of accounting and issuing of medication. Moreover, the list of drugs, as mentioned in the film, is limited. This is what makes medication unavailable to patients and people who suffer from severe pain. The Student Games 2017 will be held in Almaty, Kazakhstan. A thematic meeting was held in Almaty, chaired by the Education and Science Minister Bakhajan Jomagulov. Due to student games, the athletes village to accommodate 20,000 people will be built in the city with plans to use it as a student dormitory later on. Kazakhstan has been taking part in the competition since 2001 and won 62 medals including 18 gold and 18 silver. Last year though, wasn't particularly successful for the local students. <laughs> The very first Winter Student Games took place in Shamoni, France. Last year it was held in Turkey, this time in Slovenia, then in Spain in 2015 and finally in Almaty in 2017. The Games is a significant event in the world of sports. As a rule, 60% of people who take part in Student Games later move on to the Olympics. This is all we have time for now. Thank you for watching and have a productive week.